Before we com commence the second two panels of today's conference assessing the state of U.S.-India relations, economic relations, um, we're going to take a look first at the concept of smart cities. Um, now, before uh, jumping into it, I know we've got a number of folks that just joined um, after the, uh, uh, the, the luncheon session here, and I expect it's going to continue to grow as we head towards the Honorable Finance Minister's speech at the end of the day. Uh, very excited to be the first organization to host him on his first trip since taking over that role. Um, but, uh, you know, I just wanted to, to, to take the time again um, to note uh, the great cooperation that we had leading up to this point uh, with both the Wadwani Foundation, which uh, I share a parentage, and the, uh, uh, the Ananta Aspen Center uh, from New Delhi in organizing this program. And also, it couldn't have been possible without the financial support from a few uh, uh, groups that came forward, uh, Corning, uh, Prudential, Oracle, uh, Tata, and Taj. So if you see folks from those companies milling around, uh, please do say thanks uh, for the lunch, and thanks for having some of the best hotels in the world. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So after the Modi government gets elected, after they take office, Smart cities, it's a concept that existed beforehand, but they added a lot of new energy to it. Certainly it wasn't talked about, uh, to, that I saw anyways, in quite, the, quite that context in India. The announcement that they wanted to develop 100 smart cities. And I think at that time too, the US government was so interested and eager in trying to restart relations, which had been rock bottom a year ago, that when we saw these big grand initiatives get announced, we had to think, what can we do to support that? Well, that kind of gets back to two other questions. What the heck is a smart city, and who pays for it? I'm sure there's a lot of other great questions too, but you know, these are some of the things. What is a smart city? A lot of different definitions out there. A lot of ideas on how to finance it, what might work, might not. The US government has announced that three smart cities in India we're gonna partner with. Um, Allahabad, uh, Ajmer, and Vizag. So there's three that we've actually officially uh, voiced our support for actually helping develop. Uh, a few announcements related to that, but uh, I think most of the work has yet to be done. So I thought, what a terrific idea to bring together some of the, most, uh, some of the smartest and cr most creative people that I've been able to see in the, in the horizon, uh, thinking about and looking at smart cities, and have a conversation about what constitutes one, what does not constitute a smart city, and what role might the US be able to play, both from the corporate side and from the government side. So four terrific speakers uh, here to cover this topic today. Uh, starting uh, on my right and your left, uh, Akilesh Talotia, who joins us all the way from Mumbai. We've actually got, I think, the most traveled panel here today. <laughs> I'll still count you, South that just to add to the mileage on this. Um, coming from, uh, from Mumbai, leads thematic research and market strategy reports uh, on Indian equity markets for Kotak. Um, also noted author with uh, his, his, uh, his first book just, uh, just came out called The Making of India. And uh, I devour all the stuff since we first met in Mumbai a few months ago, everything that he puts out. Tying together these big changes that are happening in India with what it means for investors. Um, and a good day, I hope that I can play that role somewhat here from Washington. So uh, Catherine uh, McCallop Thompson uh, from Bechtel. So responsible for integration of sustainability into strategies, proposals, and projects. Of course, Bechtel is a hand in many of the greatest infrastructure projects around the world. Uh, Denise Lee, you know, when I first started uh, looking around at what is a smart city, uh, a lot of your work and material was some of the first stuff that popped up when I did that. So uh, when we decided to add this, I reached out to my good friend Jim Brady, who's, a ma who's part of our uh, advisory board here at the foundation, and said, uh, who is this Denise? You know, I'd love to meet her. Well, she's in South Africa, but she volunteered to move to the United States in order to make this happen. So Denise, great to have you here as well. <laughs> Only a partial joke on that. You'll notice her Boston accent. Uh, I told you I'd weave that in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and Suparno Banerjee, um, who, who, who uh, uh, joins us from, uh, from Hewlett Packard. Uh, Suparno, uh, I just met for the first time recently, and I just couldn't believe we'd never crossed paths because we go to the same barber. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> as a member. <laughs> <laughs> if I was sharing the next panel, Rustam from Corning, we get the same joke too. So, <laughs> um, he's a member of the office of the CEO and is responsible for growth uh, in HP's uh, public sector business. And prior to assuming this role, uh, Suparna was vice president for strategy uh, for HP's work uh, enterprise group in Asia Pacific and Japan. Um, so that's the order of the panelists as well. So let me turn it over first to Akilesh. And you can speak from here or at the, at the lectern, whichever you prefer. Sure. I'll just uh, head out there. Great. Great. Thank you, Rick, and uh, thank you, everybody. This is, uh, I hope I'll 
wake you up from your luncheon session. <laughs> uh, when Rick first uh, reached out to me and said that we want to discuss uh, the smart cities in India, my first question to him was, do we even know what uh, smart cities is? Uh, and I think that is, uh, at, least, at least when I come in here, one of the things that I want to take away is to get a sense of what uh, India would want to do and take learnings away from here in terms of what India can do uh, in respect of developing its uh, smart cities in India. Uh, I think it's interesting that the U.S. has already come ahead and identified three cities which want to become smart. Uh, so let's see how uh, things go ahead from here. What I wanted to do to set, in some sense, the tone for the panel was to give you a broad sense of where things stand with respect to urbanization in India, what, how cities, in some sense, are organized in India, and what are the challenges and opportunities that could open up, what are the sort of numbers that we're looking at in terms of funding, et cetera, and how things could go ahead. Um, so, uh, a quick point uh, about uh, urbanization is that in the reason people come into cities across the world, and especially through in India, is that cities do provide a much better economic opportunity than what rural uh, countryside typically ends up providing. We, uh, in the earlier panel, there was a discussion about how agriculture has been growing at about 2% and how people want to potentially be a part of the growth story in India. And cities are, in some sense, a very logical place to come to uh, in terms of the growth that would potentially come in here. I think one of the key advantages of coming to the city is that cities are in a much better position to provide public utility, something that becomes very difficult to provide in far-flung rural India. Uh, rural India or Indian villages uh, number 600,000 to provide the sort of facilities that are required to be uh, to reach out to such a large number of places, it just becomes a big challenge. Uh, a city, you can derive a lot of scale benefits, and I think that is, in some sense, the key theme that we will see as we go ahead when we talk about the smart city story. Uh, for me, when I think about the sort of public utilities that cities could provide much better, I look at uh, what in Indian politics has been a slogan about Bijli Sadak Pani, which is power, water, and roads. And I add to that Shiksha, Swasthya, and Suraksha, which is education, health, and security in general. So to that extent, these six services form the bedrock of why people would move into a city after having figured out that there is a much better economic model to move into cities, much better jobs, et cetera, that are potentially possible. And I think as we talk about where smartness will come in, I think the smartness will potentially come in in how we deliver some of these uh, goods to people in uh, urban cities. The order of magnitude of urbanization in India is actually somewhat disappointing for observers. Uh, if we go back all the way back to 1971, uh, India was about 20% urbanized, if we go back to our census numbers then, which is broadly the number uh, for China in 1971. Since then, the 2011 census tells us that we have moved to about 31% urbanization. So that's about 12 percentage points increase in urbanization over the last 40 years. In the meanwhile, China's moved from about 20 to about 51% in uh, the same 40-year time frame. I think one of the key reasons why urbanization takes place is simply uh, because you require new places, new cities where you would do a lot more manufacturing, you would do a lot more uh, industrial work. India has quickly moved from being an agriculture economy to becoming a services-dominated economy. And in a services-dominated economy, it just makes sense to move to cities which are already thriving, which are already big, rather than go out to newer cities. And hence, in some sense, the story of India's urbanization has not been a story of creating new cities. It's been a story of megapolises becoming much larger. So you have a Delhi NCR region, which expands out into four or five older cities, which merge into one, Bombay becoming a much larger uh, city, taking into account Nabi Mumbai, Thane areas, Chennai expanding out, Bangalore expanding out. But you would rarely hear of a new big city coming up in India. And I think that manifests itself in saying that the top 8 to 10 cities would account for almost 25% of India's urban population. This number is very, very different across China or the US, where a much smaller proportion of people would live in such megapolises. But there will be a large number of cities in the 1 to 5 million population range. And that is what I call the missing middle. In India, you have very few cities which are in that range. You either have a large number of very, very small towns and villages which are morphing into becoming uh, small cities or uh, hubs where a lot of villages would congregate, or you would have megapolises. So to that extent, I think the way urbanization is panning out in India is that you focus a lot more on the top eight or 10 cities. That's where a bulk of your urban population would be. And there is a large uh, chunk of uh, smaller places which are now beginning to get slightly more densely populated. Uh, while I did mention that India's urbanization rate is about 31%, if you go by government uh, definitions or uh, census definitions of how things stand, 
uh, we have a very curious way in which we define urbanization in India. And one of the, uh, one of the uh, aspects or one of the rules uh, of defining urbanization is that in a place, for a place to be called urban, 75% uh, of the people living there or men uh, living there need to work outside of agriculture. Now, given the fact that more than half of India is indeed employed in agriculture, that is a very stringent benchmark that we have set for ourselves, and which is where we end up undercounting uh, urbanization significantly. If we were to do away with this restriction and look at just the fact that people living densely together would be an urban area, the official definition would then, in some sense, move from a 31% uh, urbanization to closer to about 49% of urbanization. So what you do have is a lot of places where people are living in densely populated areas, but these are towns which are 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 people strong. They are not really cities. They are not places where you could potentially provide the scale benefits for providing the six public utilities that I was talking of uh, in any meaningful manner, but they are still not large places, and they are not large places where some of these scale benefits would come in. So I think when we think about urbanization in India, it's not the same US or the China story where you have a large number of maybe 100 odd cities through to which you will provide public utilities. I think this is an important distinction to keep in mind, uh, especially as we talk about big numbers uh, for smart cities. The other interesting uh, aspect of cities in India is the fact that Indian cities are really puny. I just couldn't get any other word for it. They, they are just very, very small in size when it comes to uh, cities across the world. A Bombay's of a Mumbai, sorry, I'm still used to calling it Bombay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mumbai's uh, uh, land area, if you go by official records, is only about 550 square kilometers. That compares with three to 8,000 square kilometers for London, Tokyo, uh, New York, etc. So in a sense, we still live in, a, uh, in very, very tightly packed cities. And that is not a surprise, uh, simply because I think we have thoroughly underinvested in our ability to move people across longer distances. Even in a small city like Mumbai, and I, by small I mean geographically small, uh, it still takes a lot of time to, for people to move from one place to another. And again, the point that we mentioned is that the reason people are coming into cities is that they find better jobs. If you make commute to jobs pretty long, people are forced to pack and live, them, live closer. Hence, one of the corollaries of developing a smart city is to develop very smart transportation, fast and cheap transportation, such that people could move longer distances. And if people could indeed move longer distances, you would have much better quality of life. The average house uh, in India is about 80 uh, square feet. The average per capita housing available uh, to people is about 80 square feet. And I joke that human right requirements in the US for prisoners is 60 square feet. So to some extent, we are living in really very, very small uh, uh, apartments in India. And the reason for that is we are, we are simply unable to commute over long distances. So we need to live very close to our work in terms of the distances that we would travel, but still in terms of time, the amount of uh, commute that we do is still very, very large. So one of the key aspects of uh, how cities will potentially start to become smart is how they begin to transport people uh, over longer distances in that, and how they begin to think of scale, in a sense. One of the other things that I wanted to point out is across the world over the last century, cities have lost density meaningfully, which goes back to the point of saying the cities have expanded out dramatically, even as the numbers uh, of the citizens in the cities have increased. Uh, and if India were to indeed see the trend of de-densification, and we start from a very high base of density, uh, Indians will, India will really need to rethink about the size and scale of Indian uh, urbanization. Uh, our numbers suggest that we would require anywhere upwards of five to 10 Mumbai's being created, anywhere between uh, 3,000 to 5,000 square kilometers of new area being created every year, as opposed to the 1,000 to 2,000 square kilometer number or the one Chicago a year number that uh, is typically what is spoken of. So I think in terms of scale, we really need to re-envision the scale that India is talking of in terms of uh, the, the size of urbanization that will happen. A quick uh, point to someone who would worry about uh, India's agriculture in that sense, India's urbanization today is less than 3% of India's geographical area. Uh, as we were discussing in the earlier panel, agriculture is almost 48% of India's land mass. So even if India's urbanization were to even double or triple from here in terms of land area, we would never even reach into double digit land area required for urbanization. So I think that for debate that gets created as to is urbanization is a challenge to agriculture, I think we should just stay clear of that and realize that there is, uh, there is still scope for cities to expand out meaningfully. 
uh, which takes us back to the point of uh, how do cities become smart. And I think uh, for me, uh, as a citizen and as someone who would think about urbanization, it goes back to the point about how do you use the scale benefits that come in from making of a city in making life much easier for people. And I go back to those uh, six points, the Bijli, Sadak, Pani, Shiksha, Swasti, Suraksha. And the reason I say that in Hindi is because these are catchphrases which are now beginning to uh, get the attention of politicians in India. Uh, so whether it's power, water, roads, uh, education, health, and security, we should use, in some sense, uh, the scale benefits that some of uh, the cities could provide. And if you're able to use either technology to do that or much better quality of information that is now available to plan for some of these things, I think life could be much easier for citizens. They would spend a lot less of their time and energy and money in, uh, in trying to live in a city and could genuinely enjoy the benefits of uh, having come to cities from, uh, uh, from rural India. The challenge that India has faced in providing some of these uh, uh, basic services has been that the government has, in effect, taken on these responsibilities of providing some of these services, but has meaningfully failed, uh, at least in urban centers, to provide uh, some of these utilities uh, to people. And what that has done is it has imposed what I like to call a private cost of public failure. The, the fact that publicly we are not able to provide many of these things, people just internalize the cost. They create their own power in some cases. They rely on tanked water. They rely on uh, their own uh, ability to transport themselves rather than use public transport, or they would go to private schools, et cetera. I am not uh, recommending a nationalization of many of these things, but all I'm saying is that uh, these have created opportunities for people, uh, for companies in India to provide some of these services, and I think those are some of the growth opportunities that investor in some, investors in some sense love. But they have not been able to create the scale benefits that urbanization could have created in India, and I think that is, uh, that is where a meaningful amount of uh, discussion and debate and I think ideation could uh, uh, help from here. Uh, our numbers seem to suggest that if we are going to provide people uh, some of these uh, utilities, et cetera, and provide much better quality housing and transport, India would require upwards of two to two and a half trillion dollars over the course of this one decade. And I think those are meaningfully large numbers. For context, India's GDP is broadly about two trillion dollars today. So we are looking at anywhere upwards of 10% of GDP being invested every year in the sheer act of urbanization in India. Those are large numbers. Those are numbers that I don't think the government currently has the fiscal budget or the mandate in some sense to be able to foot. So these would be interesting opportunities that would uh, open up. Uh, I've listed down some uh, ways in which the government could raise finances. And there are ways in which potentially private companies could come in and uh, begin to make uh, advantages of the fact that uh, there, is, there is a willingness to pay in people when they get better quality of uh, products and services uh, when it comes to urbanization. And I think. That's the broad lay of the land as uh, it stands with respect to urbanization. And as I said, I would want to educate myself as to how we'll become smart from here. That's terrific. Thank you. <laughs> well, a great scene setter on the numbers that are right, the numbers that are wrong, and the opportunity <laughs> that exists through all that. So, uh, Catherine, over to, uh, to you. All right. Um, I'll go to I think, a couple of slides. Um, so when I think of cities, I think of them really simply in terms of them being people and infrastructure. Maybe because I work for Bechtel, which builds infrastructure. Um, but Smart Cities really connects those two in new ways, using the information technologies to improve lives. So um, that's really kind of what it's all about and then making sure you're, you're set up to take advantage of that. Um, so technology really is to provide real and tangible benefits to infrastructure, to people, and to the environment through a better, cheaper, and more sustainable solution. And that's really what we're talking about here. Um, but I think also we need to include the term resilient in, in terms of what we're thinking about, because A, infrastructure is a long-term investment. And B, you know, we're under a world with a lot of changing circumstances, um, potential climate change impact, you know, all kinds of disruptions, sudden perhaps relocations or migrations of people or gradual that suddenly become much more of a problem than they were anticipated to be or present a lot of opportunities as well. So um, if we can challenge ourselves in the implementation of smart cities to provide resilient infrastructure to address things like water scarcity, 
sustainable design and construction, uh, urban growth, and electricity with the increasing demand that comes. And then, you know, a lot of cities have the, uh, you know, the official electricity consumers and then the unofficial electricity <laughs> consumers. And so then trying to uh, use technology to help um, in scheduling and making sure that brownouts are, are not frequent because of these uh, uh, irregularities, we might say, uh, is a way that it can be used and applied to really make people's lives better. Um, and so if we think about the global trends that are happening, that they really do require a step change in the way um, we design and construct and operate systems and structures in order to benefit society for the long term. And mega cities uh, have to consider the cost and scale um, of disruption caused by things like energy system failures. And how would we future proof urban energy systems? And there's a lot of ways to do that in both the provisional electricity and the management of them. Um, is there something I have to push differently? Okay. So in thinking about you know, some of the mega trends and the way that, um, that we can respond and what the opportunities are in smart city, there's a lot of responsibilities and a lot of opportunities. And so looking at the different sectors and then the different pieces of the puzzle, um, these are all ways that smart city technologies can improve the delivery of services, can broaden the delivery of services, and uh, attract investment because, uh, uh, you know, let's face it, nicer cities are places where then more people want to come and do businesses and, and invest um, so that that makes a difference as well. And they really kind of touch on all aspects. And so we should be focusing on things that either make li people's lives better or that are efficient uh, and certainly cost effective. <clears throat> and when we think about cost effective too, we need to really think about the long term. So a lot of smart cities technologies are things that help in the operations and maintenance phase, which can be a real problem because if you spend all this money to invest in infrastructure and then you don't operate it well or maintain it, then you know, you've sort of lost the value from that investment. Um, mentioned resiliency and really, <clears throat> excuse me, all of this to make people's lives better. Um, there's no doubt that there are a lot of exciting opportunities and benefits in smart cities. Um, but before you get to that, you have to do a lot of thought and a lot of planning. And what cities sometimes lack is an understanding of the broader process needed to drive, to lead them to the changes that can end to this fantastic technology-driven end state. And so, of course, one of the most difficult challenges in that is really defining the vision of a smart city. So what does it mean in different contexts? And certainly a megacity's version and definition is going to be different than a population of 500,000 or a million. And then having a coherent direction of where the city should go. Um, this, of course, is made more difficult through the complexity of the political process and competing priorities and needs. And there's always more ideas than money. So then we need to make sure that we're investing smartly and in ways that really can start to generate some economic returns that can be cycled back into the program. And I think it helps if you've got a strong champion. So for these 100 cities programs, I hope that each one of them you know, will be led by a strong, a strong champion who gets the different departments united, and that's always difficult to do in governing at any level, is to involve um, the different sectors and the different, different departments because that's what Smart Cities is about. It's about integrating a lot of the different disciplines and um, application of technologies in a way that not only puts it all together but then can use it and leverage it as, as you're going along so that you get the most benefit out of it. It does no good to put fancy things in place and then um, let them fall apart. Um, so these are clearly require collaboration and a team approach, which is not always easy, easy to succeed. And the champion needs to create accountable teams that are motivated to achieve success. And I mention these things because for uh, companies, it's a lot easier to work with uh, customers or, or cities or governments that have all of this together. And so when you do, then you're not constantly changing direction. You can provide the best advice and that you can implement things in the easiest way. Um, and then another recommendation would really just be to start with small wins to generate momentum. Um, some easy places to start are things like smart water meters or smart street lights, 
um, that direct traffic to prioritize public transportation, for example. Those are easier to put into place, they're not too complicated, and they're really, you know, people can recognize that the benefits they derive from that, and then you can sort of build from there. So just a couple of kind of little diagrams to sort of what are, you know, what are we talking about in a little more detail. So you can start at the micro level at smart buildings because the more, the smarter buildings can be in terms of reducing their energy demand or water demand or treatment of those issues or um, of water supply, et cetera, then you're having less overall demand when aggregated across the whole, the whole city. So buildings, making buildings smarter and working together is a really good start. Um, things like smart energy, everything from interconnection standards with different distributed sources of energy, and, and a lot of those can then be renewable. Um, smart telecommunications, which is often you know, kind of the backbone that puts it all together, but those can be leveraged to do things, again, like to reduce energy and water use, to provide better services, and <clears throat> provide ways of communicating with the population about uh, different services and availabilities and things to take advantage of and maybe distribute sometimes the load a little bit more um, smoothly instead of the peaks that can create you know the congestion problems and challenges for systems as well as for people. Uh, and then smart transportation, which um, we're involved in a little bit more, but you know again like reducing trip time with synchronized traffic lights and smart parking and public transit coordination and making this information. Uh, more readily available so that people have more choices and the ability to use that information to, to make their lives better. So these smart cities are sort of this interplay between what government does on its side and then what people do on their side and then, um, and then working together. And then of course things like smart water and wastewater and of course water is going to always, always be a big issue and will continue to be a bigger issue both on the supply side of uh, clean water provision and then on the um, effluent side in terms of both wastewater and stormwater management. And so things like using um, systems and sensors that can identify leaks because most municipal water systems are plagued by an, uh, an abundance of leaks which result in all of the cost of cleaning and delivering the systems, you know, a, a good portion of those are, are lost. Um, so those can make a big difference as well. So. Um, for us, as, as planners uh, up front, as well as then implementers of, of infrastructure, so we're thinking about things in terms of um, these basic steps, essentially. So collecting the data, and in many countries and places, that is a real difficult challenge. So sometimes you have to be a little more creative in your data search, um, so using either international sources or old-fashioned talking to people and <laughs> getting a sense of, you know, how typical is this or what, is, what was it like in the past and then kind of cobbling things together a little bit. Um, so it doesn't, just because you don't have data from obvious sources don't, doesn't mean you don't have data to use. Um, and then communicating those information uh, it, uh, amongst each other and kind of verifying and validating and then crunching the data and making sense of that in order to do, um, in order to do the planning that needs to be done. Um, so our approach really, we try to take a holistic approach. And so we start from master planning is something that we can offer um, and building then plans and things in alliance with different vendors and the city itself in order to implement things. So there can be certain initiatives on its own, but mostly it's really on the backbone of other things. So when you're creating water infrastructures or transportation infrastructures or energy infrastructures, you're looking at what is the most, um, uh, cost effective and efficient and what, what need are you getting at uh, in order to apply some smart cities technologies into the infrastructure and things that we're designing. Um, so I'm going to talk about just a couple of examples and case studies. So I'm recently back from uh, two years in Gabon, which is a small-ish country um, on the uh, western coast of Africa on the equator. And one of the things that we did in looking at this city that is kind of so not suddenly, but uh, recently grown from uh, a couple hundred thousand to nearing a million people, and that's about half the population of the country. So of course, that has been developed in a very chaotic and unplanned you know, way as people come and just kind of settle in and build wherever they can. So um, thinking about ways to deal with that, and that's a common problem for a lot of countries, and so we looked at one neighborhood, which is kind of the center of town, 
and using smart technologies um, like a software called InfraWorks that enables you, it's a GIS-based program that enables you to layer upon information. So looking at the natural topography of the area, which is hilly, um, and then using the boundary there of the watershed and thinking about things not so much as a political boundary, but a natural systems boundary. Um, and then what kind of improvements can we make? So in terms of road developments, then matching that need for infrastructure and roads with the provision of utilities and wastewater and stormwater all as a system. And then what kind of things can we put into place in a smart city's way in a, in a place that isn't so sophisticated and that doesn't have a lot of data? And so what, you know, what really makes the most sense? And so <clears throat> a good place to start really is public transit, which um, is just being reborn there. <coughs> So making that more attractive and convenient and easy. And then um, other things in terms of water and wastewater planning and sensors. And then another one is using technology, soft technology, which are less about information communications, but things like the smart code, which is a form-based code that focuses on, on communities around walkable and mixed use. So that there's parks and schools and civic spaces all in the same neighborhood, instead of just saying, okay, the city needs 5,000 housing units, well, how are you gonna organize those housing units and how do you create it in a way that is smart um, and that makes sense for people and from an investment perspective? So the government can invest in the infrastructure and the private sector can invest in the commercial and the housing development. And so, um, and putting in the first community wastewater treatment um, system in that community and using smarter technologies to do that down to things like solar-powered street lights you know, with sensors and that can come on um, as needed as opposed to being on you know, all of the time. So even, even kind of smaller and, and little things. Um, another example, uh, we talked about manufacturing and services um, in Saudi Arabia as the company developing phosphate production in the north. And so with phosphate <clears throat> as the core industry and then all of the uh, peripheral industries that are going to develop, that means that then you're going to create a new city uh, in order to serve all of that. And so master planning that, using all of these principles and thinking about all of the systems together, all of the infrastructure that's needed together, and using smart concepts in urban planning and all, and then of course in that location, extensive use of alternative energy and water reuse and uh, smart technologies being part of that. But the whole purpose for that really is to diversify the economy, create jobs, and um, boost the private sector involvement and investment. Uh, another example is in the various economic cities that are being done in, um, around different themes and areas, so one of them being the um, King Abdullah Economic City and focusing again on all the interaction <coughs> of all of these technologies and <coughs> a few more resources in, uh, available there as opposed to a developing country context, but it just shows how all of this uh, can work together no matter what the context um, you're using. So I just wanted to mention um, that Bechtel uh, is a member of the Smart Cities Council. So anybody really interested in, that, in this topic should look further uh, to the Smart Cities Council. Um, it was founded a couple of years ago and uh, really as an advisor and as a market accelerator. So involving companies and cities and governmental entities to come together and kind of put some boundaries around the vision and the definition of smart cities. Um, and, uh, and, and to advance them in a way that's really productive. And the site provides all kinds of examples, too, of how smart cities um, are being implemented around the world in both the developed, country, developed countries and the developing world. Um, and it, they're working hand in hand now, um, I understand, with the USTDA to produce kind of a, a readiness guide with the government of India to address challenges that are being faced in terms of water and energy resources, population growth, migration, pollution. So when you think about those, some of those issues as your starting point, then how can some of these smart cities technologies um, be used to, to help solve those problems? Um, and then finally, so a good starting point for governments in particular is the smart, smart cities readiness guide. So you can, this is available for download on the internet, and it's kind of a, a bit of a checklist approach for our cities ready for it, and what do they need to do to get ready to take the most advantage they can of, of some of these partnerships and technologies. And um, one of the things I've learned um, in the last several years especially is if you don't have a plan, you know, you don't really know where you're going. And the more you have a plan, then you can see whether proposals fit into your plan, as opposed to just taking, you know, okay, there's an opportunity here, there's an opportunity there, there's an opportunity there. 
And then if they don't all come together, then, um, then the scarce resource of money isn't being used to the advantage as it really could be. So I think um, tools like this are a really good place to start, not only for cities, but also for partners and potential partners with cities to understand a little bit about how to go about with a, a roadmap and a strategy. That's all been, you know, vendor neutral guidance and so on, but it's a really good tool. So um, in closing, I'd just like to offer that I, that I, I hope that the 100 Smart Cities Initiative um, is implemented in a way that results in real resilient and sustainable cities through smart deployment of technologies in an organized and collaborative program. And I'm sure that it will be. Thank you. Great. <laughs> oh, so there's a million ways to make a city smart, but I think a point you made early on, which makes sure that it's data-led decisions. You know, don't follow the, the cool, sexy thing, but make sure that every step that you take on this, especially as we talked about with funding, is relatively limited. Deploy it where it's going to make the most impact. So uh, um, now I'll turn it over to, uh, to Denise, please. Thank you. So, so in my experience, and, and I've worked on a number of smart cities projects across Africa, and uh, we have a, a, a very, very strong footprint within India, and our team is busy engaging uh, with India directly at the moment as well. Um, my experience has been that there is no start and there is no end for a smart city. It, it's a journey, right? And with, with smart cities, it's really about smart citizens. And as long as the people that are coming together and pulling it together are evolving and growing, whether you've got 10 people in a city or you've got 20 billion in a city, they still have the same fundamental needs and desires as you and I do. The only difference is that the fundamental infrastructure that surrounds them is going to be a little bit different. So I think at the starting point when we talk about smart cities, it needs to be citizen-centric. You can't start with a, we're going to make money with it, or um, you know, we are going to grow our geographical footprint, whatever. It needs to be, if I get up in the morning and I pick up my smartphone, what do I want to do? If there's a problem, how do I, how am I enabled, how do I go about making it better? because that's the starting point. The predicted trends are is that the power is passing from the state-led governments down to provincial governments, down to local governments, and then to cities. And that's anticipated, and it maps the urbanization map that we've seen with, um, with the predicted trends to 2050, which just makes sense, right? So, so how does that actually work then? We need to start learning to do more with less. We are running out of our natural resources. So whether it's about whether it's about um, there's not enough water and we need to implement new technologies to measure the water. It's also about retaining water and how we can use water better and the filtration of that water. The same with electricity. South Africa, um, and Africa is notorious at the moment for having brownouts and absolute blackouts, um, rolling blackouts at the moment. And it's dreadful because South Africa produces the majority of electricity for the whole of the continent. It's a bit of a concern. Mm. So um, we have a number of solar wind farms that are, are, are cropping up, and we're starting to, to look at alternative sources of energy. And that's absolutely relevant. And if I have a look at what's happening with India at the moment, there's startups that also have also identified gravity-based energy systems that are now coming into the cloud as well, that are now looking to be exported to the rest of the world, which I think is phenomenal. We also talk about cohesion and integration. The government, the people, and private sector have to come together. It's not about, it is your responsibility, and this is my responsibility, and we're going to kind of come together. We all have to take equal ownership in terms of what needs to happen. And with that, we have to identify what the problem is and what are we going to do about it. Now, if we, if we have a look at trends um, in, in emerging territories, like the BRICS countries, excuse me, um, you, it, it's a Deloitte report. Excuse me, and they've linked the, the cell phone usage, so th what, what has happened is they've increased um, mid to, to low class individuals, roughly 10%, and they've given them access to cell phone technology that they never previously had. And that directly quantified to an increase in the GDP of 1.2% growth. And what that means is that the more people are connected, the more they have access to, the more that they want to do. Um, and it brings out the inner consumer. Now that in itself, links back to the fact that once you have the connectivity, which is a fundamental underpinning criteria for a smart city, because you need that connectivity, 
once you have that, where, where do the boundaries of that city stop? Where do they start? Because I can sit on my phone and I can access something in Algeria right now, depending, I'm only restricted in terms of the technology that I have at my fingertips, which is amazing, but it's also fairly daunting in its own right, because you've just, that ability allows me to cross multi-jurisdictions. And we start talking about the creepy issues around governance, around legislation. So I think when, when I think back to this morning's session, there are a couple of points that resonated with me around trade, um, around trust. I think the words that we used this morning specifically were um, transparency, predictability. Um, Secretary Novelli spoke about the legality. It all fundamentally comes down to trust. And the minute that the trust is enabled between one country and another, trade will flow naturally from that point. It must happen. So in, in, in my opinion, and understanding the respective smart cities engagements that we've worked on, the first thing that needs to be considered in a smart city or a smart citizen structure is what are you doing with smart governance? What is the, le the legal and the regulatory framework that you're adopting? The fundamental principle is that information is shared through data. It's the breakdown of silos between the different areas sharing it and being able to make data-driven decisions the predictability, and understanding the 360-degree view of the situation. Now, all that data is kind of just randomly floating around in cyberspace. It's sitting in someone's cloud somewhere. What is happening from a cybersecurity perspective on that? Is that protected? Is it meeting all the respective legislative requirements of all the folks that are going to be tapping into that? Now, there are different data privacy laws between India, between the US, um, between Europe, etc. Who's protecting that? Who is safeguarding that? And who's ensuring that that data is not potentially getting into the wrong hands? Because that's not really a smart city then. Data is predicted to be the next natural resource out there. And absolutely, information is power. But when you share it, it's an enabler on, on every sense. So um, if we have a look, in October 2013, the UK Department of Business and Innovation did a survey across six cities. And those six cities, um, the survey was specifically focused on how they are delivering smart technologies. They're not smart cities in the truest sense where they have every single tenant of a smart city with smart banking, smart finance, smart water, smart you know, animals, etc. It was more <coughs> about what have they done to uplift that community on some level. And taxation came up as a, as a discussion point this morning. If you have a look, um, and, it, and it actually references it within the survey, in Chicago, one of the areas that was uncovered as, a, as a, uh, a fringe benefit, if you will, was that there was an untapped economy in terms of trade of cash. There was no regulation on it. Um, there were no taxes that were happening on it. And with the adoption of digital technology and trading now, there was an order trail that was created and a whole new revenue stream from a taxation perspective that was never, never even tapped into. So that is one area from a revenue perspective that you can have a look at. Now with India, I think you have a lot of, of, of the cities, of the mega cities potentially, you have a lot of slums, and you also have a lot of people that are rural and will continue to be rural. How, how do you enable them how do you enable those individuals within the community if they're not living in the large cities? You need to take the technology to them. They need to be enabled. Now, whether that's that they're getting education through some cloud-based device, um, like with Google Education, excuse me, with Google Education, I beg your pardon, I'm getting a call, I apologize, <laughs> um, with, with Google Education, or you see other companies that are popping up startups across Africa, across India as well, where they're taking physical kiosks that have been developed, SMEs, that are, that, that are actually taking them into the slums, into the townships. And folks can come to them and they can get their online, they can pay for the utilities online, they don't need to go all the way into the city. They can access um, their water, they can access cell phone, they can access friends and family. And they're uplifting the community. Um, because now all of a sudden you can actually track what's happening with the community. You can track where the trade is. If there's an area where there's potential issues around crime, purely based on what's happening on the digital network at that space, you can actually track what is the interest in that area. Um, and, and police forces can be deployed into that area to uplift it. When we talk about government planning, if you look at the city of um, Abu Dhabi in the UAE, 
they won an award a couple of years for, for um, a planning application from a geospatial perspective in terms of city planning so that they can erect their smart cities infrastructure around schooling. Some schools, um, depending on the subjects and depending on the focus areas, are better positioned in certain areas to others. Some communities would rather have a university built focusing on mathematics and science subjects versus another one is more on veterinary science and they have different focus areas. Um, understanding the data from those schools, understanding where to put those schools, that in itself starts a, a sustainability model for tomorrow. It's those tenants, those thoughts that need to be considered when you start talking about a smart city and a smart, um, and a smart, a smart person. But all of this needs to be regulated because how do you know that what you're doing is going in the right direction? How do you know that the data that you're getting is the correct data? How do you know that someone hasn't potentially tapped into that? How do you know that the skills that you need today that you think you need today aren't suddenly evolving into skills that are not even readily identifiable for tomorrow? If you just have a look at the number of careers that are available today that weren't even available 10 years ago, can you imagine what it's gonna look like in 10 years time? As a, as a society, we are all responsible individuals in our respective countries, but we're also all global citizens. Um, if I just listen to all the different accents and all the different folks that, are, that have been speaking today in this room, um, we have a plethora of culture sitting in this room because we all believe that this is relevant. We all have a passion for it, we understand the importance of it, and we all need to get in and, and make it work because it's the future of our planet. Well. <laughs> That's a, that's a pretty important point to, uh, to I think, conclude your remarks on. Um, you know, we, we talk about uh, that, uh, you know, safety is the key. I, I think any time that a business actually calls for regulation, you know the issue is quite serious, because <laughs> that doesn't often happen in this town in particular. <laughs> um, so let me turn it uh, over to uh, Soparno from HP. Soparno, please. Thank you. I don't think you got my deck, but I'm just going to wing it here without the deck. Um, Rick mentioned, uh, I've been, I'm with HP, I've been working in the smart city space for about eight years now. And in my journeys through Asia, through Europe, <coughs> et cetera, worked. And, you know, after I started working, before. Is, is the microphone working? working? Mic's not on. Well, not quickly. mine. Give you mine. Now? I see yeah. a light on. Now? Yeah. Yeah, great, thanks. And so before I started working there, I had a full head of hair. <laughs> <laughs> but jokes aside, uh, been working in, in Asia, in, did work in Fukushima after, and those areas in Japan after the earthquake, was in Detroit last week. And you know, you begin to see patterns. And as I work uh, in smart cities, and I lead, uh, we don't call it smart cities, we call it future cities, because we believe you never get there. You're always striving for a better tomorrow. There isn't one end state. But let me begin with five fundamental beliefs that drive everything that we do. And I'm going to take you down a very practical and pragmatic approach, because we are in this to actually deliver value to our customers. The first is that these cities are extraordinarily complex social systems. And we need to look at all the subcomponents and their interlinkages, because otherwise, it's like pushing a noodle. You just throw in a bit of technology, and things do not work. Number two, we think of cities as a city, but in my opinion, there are actually four cities in a city. And we have to think of these as virtual. Think of it as a little two-by-two two box. One is around economic affordability. I think, Denise, you referred to it. There are people who are wealthy who can create an enclave, a world of their own, and then there are some who don't have it and who still live there. The second axis is density. You have really, really dense areas, and you have low density areas. Completely different situations in terms of how you deliver services, asset utilization, the last mile delivery, et cetera. And you might find four worlds. These four worlds exist in every city that I've come across in the world. There may be some parts that are bigger. 24% of India's population live in slums, in one. Ultra dense, not being able to afford. There are enclaves, you go in Gurgaon, if you walk inside, you will find you're in world A. 
And if you walk outside the gates, it's a different world. The question is, how do we balance the needs of all four? The city has to cater to the needs of all four of these. Point number two. Point number three, the business model becomes extraordinarily important. It's these cities are all in a perfect storm. There's a lot of citizen expectations in terms of 24 by 7 by 365 service. Akhilesh, you talked about the massive urbanization that is taking place. Just, just imagine the scale. Those numbers don't mean anything. The busiest airport on this planet is Atlanta. They get about 400 airplanes a day. Imagine 800 jumbo jets landing, each disgorging their passengers. They all come to the baggage counter, pick up their bags, the elderly, the young, the dead, the dying, the to be born, etc. And they walk out, and not one single person ever returns to take a flight back. They stay there. And this is what's going to happen to our planet each and every day. No Saturdays, no Sundays, no Christmas holidays, nothing. It's going to happen for the foreseeable future. Why? Why are these cities getting to be, have shifted? It's because of several factors. One, because of the emergence of knowledge economies where the clustering effect of having people together, having businesses together, is driving greater value. So everybody wants to eat together. And second is the cost of transportations have come down so that you know the initial bit of transportation pushing everybody outside and now, again, the reverse with connectivity, with web, and the other forms of transportation, everybody wants to be in because the value creation happens when you have complexity and when you have density. So this space is going to continue, but you need to do a lot of things differently. Fourth, technology is going to be a massive game changer, but it's not the only thing. Why we heard the, the statistics that you gave, Akhilesh, and I, I'm just giving you rough back of the envelope estimates. India has 1.06 doctors per 1,000 people. The standard here is 3.2 in the Western world. India has about 1.1 beds per 1,000 people. In some countries, it's four to six. Let's assume that you will not get even to that stage. Let's get, assume that in the next 25 years, we just get to the midpoint of these. You'll need over a million doctors. You'll need over a million schools, uh, classrooms. You will need 500,000 hospital beds, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You cannot, you can maybe throw money at the problem. You can create these. But it takes seven, eight, 10 years to get a doctor trained, right? So we have to create leverage. We cannot solve the old world problems the same way. So that leads us to the fifth thing that the cities and the resources need to be connected. We can't think of these cities in isolation. They have to create leverage, because there aren't enough resources going around. And B, the cities have to be anchors so that they support the region, the tier two, tier three, tier four cities. Because without that, the more we update and upgrade and make these cities smarter, all you do is accelerate internal migration. And these cities can never cope. So five fundamental beliefs. So what do we come in with as the technology provider HP? So we are coming at it, and we've got projects that we've been doing. These are paying projects. This is not corporate social responsibility. This is where we make money at it. And I will start giving you some examples. So um, I'm going to follow some threads around here. So the first is taking a journey of driving a city and creating capacity and driving some outcomes. So for example, the work that we are doing in northern England. Uh, a microcosm of the UK, about a million and a half people, but a significantly elderly population. The work that we are doing is actually identifying the most important segments in that population that need the care. Why? Because each case there, in terms of a foster child or what's called as a troubled family, takes 100,000 pounds a case. And what can we do to drive down the cost? It's not about the 3% that IT takes, what's about the 97%. And by working with 
the child and with the family, we find that 31 different agencies touch that one case. Eight different inspectors go there to take a look at the case. What can you do now to cut down on that? Do you need 31 agencies intervening? No, you don't. You can do it maybe 17. Can four inspectors do the job? And therefore, you find you have 10, 12, 15% savings in operational budget. Why is that important? Because in all of these cities, if we can save money, that money could be repurposed to drive the business point you were making. So let me step back a bit with that one example to say, how do we look at cities? We look at cities in terms of six integrated dimensions. And you can't separate one out. The first is we need to create livable cities, because people today have a choice. If it's not livable, they are not going to go there. And what does livable mean? It means it's a safe city. It's a clean city in terms of water, power, environment, et cetera. And it's culture and vibrancy. Two very vibrant, very, very difficult concept to pin. What makes a city vibrant over another? So some of these dimensions. The second bit is that the city should drive the new economy. It should create new jobs. It should create the ability to retain jobs and also attract small businesses, medium. And you can have a whole plethora of, we have six dimensions under that, which says, what about the education? What about the infrastructure? What about connectivity? What about transport? Third, the city needs to be connected. It needs to be able to move people. It needs to be able to move goods. It needs to be able to move information. Fourth, it needs to have core services that enable everything else to happen. Education, healthcare, social services, the government services, trash removal, everything else. And two very important things that keep coming up over and over again when I speak to cities and their CIOs. One, how do we, as cities, drive agility in being able to respond to changes? B, how do we drive resilience, being able to bounce back or manage events and shocks? Right? And what we do is drill down and provide the technology underpinnings to drive the outcomes. And as you mentioned, Denise, that at the end of it, it's about managing a few things. It's about managing places the assets and all the things that the city has. It's about managing things that the city owns, whether it's the, the railway bogies or the trash removal vehicles or all the signals, etc. But it has two other dimensions. It's about managing resources so that it does it wisely. And in the middle of it, doing all of this, is the people dimension. Why should people care? What value do they get out of it? And that becomes the insight bit. So what I talked to you about in Norfolk is how are we helping identify the most at-risk populations to drive programs there? What we're doing, say, let's take Auckland. I mean, do Auckland Transport. And it began as they were having passenger or pedestrian and car accidents. About 300 people actually having serious accidents and deaths in the city. And the question was, why? And part of it is traffic, huge urban sport. Part of it was lots of bicyclists, many of them tending to use carbon fiber bikes. The street sensors do not pick up carbon fiber bikes. They pick up metal bikes. Right? And so a video infrastructure that does not carbon fiber, but metal. Uh, video in, uh, kind of detection to say what should happen. But that can give you in terms of citizen safety, it can give you red light, it can give you all sorts of things that gets baked in. Uh, the work that we do in Belgium, for example, is fascinating because there the government has a policy in Brussels and all of Flanders that they will ask a citizen for a piece of information only one time. You don't have to fill five forms, you don't have to do everything else, and for privacy and other things, uh, the information comes together only on an as-needed basis. There's a body that actually validates that. And after the transaction, it breaks apart. What's the value of that? Farmers who, need, who used to you know, kind of apply for agricultural subsidy previously had to fill n number of forms, and it would take four weeks to process. Today, they get it in a matter of days. If a child goes to college 
once the application is approved, the government sends them, based on this information coming together, what their eligibility for financial aid is, because it's put together where she's going to college, what her criteria is, what the parent situation is, and its service. And guess what? It's saving them 97 million euros a year in process elimination and just fundamental costs. Right? So what we're trying to do is, at a certain level, create these foundational programs. Because moving forward, we believe that we have to create for the cities, not just these cities, but the cities in India, the capacity to save money so that that money can be redeployed in making themselves smarter. There's no magic pot of gold lying anywhere. I mean, it may come <laughs> a bit from the government budget, but the cities have to figure this out, right? So what can we do to help that? Number two is, what are these foundational elements that you need to build on? Because without that, some of the subsequent programs don't work. Ask only once, a video platform, etc. Because these are core things that you can build on. And these are open systems. You can plug and play, because we don't believe we have all the answers. We are in there as a journey. The third is packaging some of these and bringing them, because part of what we find the governments also have to change is their culture. It's not about technology. Yes, we've talked about government. But how do they change the organizational culture to drive innovation, to think differently, to think outside the box, to push the envelope about changing the procurement mechanisms, create that ecosystem, bring in the customer in the room? Because what we are designing in applications in Norfolk is not us designing. It's that child in there designing the next set mobile application, because that's what's going to make it more effective, right? That she there in the room. And in that, we are packaging what we do and how we do it and bringing it to governments, because that is such an essential part of making this change sticky and sustainable. So I've kind of given you, you know, a long, uh, long winded answer in terms of what we're doing. It's and in, in the basis of that, obviously, is the entire HP portfolio that we do. We sell our products and services in many places, but what we've chosen to do is, in terms of these large, complex transformations, work with only a few. Because we don't have the bandwidth to do these kind of multi-year journeys with very many. So I want a few maybe 15, 20 really good partners, cities to work with. Because there's a lot of ground to be covered, lots of things to be learned that we need to leverage. Because other cities can learn from this. So what we're putting together is a collaboration of these 10 or 12 cities where the cities can actually share information and learn from each other. We're setting up a center of excellence in Singapore uh, where the government is co-investing with us so that they, we do city scale applications that they want to make available to other cities in the region or in the world saying, hey, take this. It, it's fine. It works. We've tested it. But you sitting in the audience who are maybe from other companies, et cetera, what can, I think, US companies do to help? I think several. One, obviously, is the innovation and technology, which I think is so essential. But it's not a straight lift and shift. It never works. It's a question of contextualizing to the needs of India. That's number one. I think what my peer companies and we, I'm sure we have, is I think we've managed some very large and complex transformation over multiple years. What we do outside of Los Angeles, we've been at it since 2002 and in version three, version four of that city. So how do we help take these cities through that journey? And fourth, third is scale. Because one thing that India has is scale, right? It's not a city with 100,000 people, you're going to find cities with a lot of people, right? And so to be able to bring solutions that scale up and drive efficiency is, I think, what we, as the corporate sector, can bring to our you know, kind of colleagues in India. And that's, honestly, that's what I'm all about here. <laughs> Terrific, Subarna. Thank you for that. Please. <clears throat>
Well, unfortunately, I have to be the, uh, the, the, the timekeeper on this one. I think we could have listened to all four for another couple of hours. Um, we got about five minutes, so we got time for a couple of really quick questions, uh, knowing that we're up against this deadline of uh, a certain individual from uh, the Ministry of Finance coming in a little bit. So we want to make sure the, the next panel has time as well. But uh, time for a couple of questions. Let's start in the, uh, the back uh, over there. Yep. And uh, so, so uh, your name, uh, where you're from, and please, really quick questions yep. here because we want to cover a couple. Uh, my name is Tracy Denholm. I just moved back from working in India for two years. Uh, I was started at Deloitte in two weeks, actually, so nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> my question is, there's this concept of Jugad in India that seems like everyday populace already has the innovation culturally in them. What's the first step for the corporate world in convincing the Indian governments to get on board with that? May I, may I take that? Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah. So I think it's a fantastic question. And I think there's a question of adaptability. So I'll, I'll give you an example to, example, uh, to just kind of drive the point home. We do what's called as, it's Jugad on steroids, let's say, right? Uh, uh, we do uh, electronic health centers in, in, in India. We've got 44 of these now. It's to provide health care in places where they've never seen a doctor ever in their lives. And this is, what's Jugad about it? Because it's a micro hospital in a shipping container. Why is it in a shipping container? Because I can move it there, that infrastructure exists. And because no doctor wants to go there, I can connect it with a teaching hospital, et cetera. So, you know, 50,000 people have been to doctors. It has a micro pharmacy, it has all of that. The question that Jugar, you can take it to Jugar too, is 400,000 people in India died in traffic accidents. Even though the pace, you can, you can out, outwalk a car in many of these places. Why does that happen? It's because you can't get that patient to the accident victim to the hospital in the golden hour, right? Are you gonna be able to solve traffic in the short term? No. Can I put these micro health centers every five kilometers as trauma centers in a city? I don't need too much land, all I need is this much, and I will save countless lives, right? That is the kind of jugar we need to be able to drive with the authorities in India to think outside the box, right? to be able to solve some of these problems. So I think that's the kind of culture we need to create. Yeah, we'll go a couple more up right there. Yeah. Hi, my name is Utsav Chakrabarti, and I'm an architect in this area. So I have worked in the uh, Tyson's Corner uh, Silver Line Renewable Master Plan project. So I have two questions. One is for Akhilesh, and my question is, what are the uh, criteria that were considered when we selected the three cities that you mentioned uh, if you could throw some light on it. I think the U.S. government has to say that. I have no idea why they selected it. <laughs> okay, so, so somebody on the panel I, can. I think it was given to us by the Indian government, if I'm not mistaken. I think okay. they <laughs> sent it over and said these are the three. I think, why is that, especially after the split of the state? Because yeah. they, so you do have to create a new capital. So certainly, you know, that's one. So there's a half answer. And, and my yeah. second question is addressed to Superno. Uh, it has been experienced that in the past, mistakes are repeated again and again, whether it's the design of Chandigarh as a city or whether it is the new cities that are coming up in China, especially Shanghai, and the rapid urbanization and expansion that have happened. What are we going to make use to make sure that such mistakes in infrastructural development are not repeated and sustainable cities are built? I think many of these, and you know, it's a long, maybe we should meet outside and continue the discussion. <laughs> I, I have a lengthy point of view. Is uh, and it's shifting, that we haven't had truly the design-centric thinking, which we put the people or the communities in the center to design around them. Uh, maybe it has been done in isolation. And so therefore, I mean, I lived in China till last year for three years, and I, you can drive and you can see cities there with nobody living. Uh, there. And it was the question that it happened in isolation without really thinking the needs of the community and why will people live there, etc. And I'll give you an answer. I mean, there was work in Mazdar City, right, that was going on. I went there and I was, we were doing some work there. And I asked, okay, you, you, you're creating this brand new city, totally carbon neutral, etc. You want 400,000 people to come and live here. Why will their children want to live there as well? Unless we think about those kinds of issues and we think about the this community-centric, the citizen-centric, and everything that goes around it, we won't have an evolving. It's not a one-time plan that lives forever. These things are living, right? The cities have to 
will outlive far, I mean, outlive 10 generations of us, right? It's going to be there 1,000 years from now. Can I also just comment on that as well? We see that a lot in Africa as well, with a lot of PPPs, um, charity organizations as well, coming into Africa and offering aid. And it's the same kind of concept. The intention as you embark upon the project is amazing, but the outcome isn't what it was intended for. And I think that any project that you embark upon, a capital project of this magnitude, you need to have that governance layer in there. You need to have a full results management office that is testing the performance of the requirements from the beginning right the way through. You need to be checkpointing at all points in time. Are the human capital requirements that you needed at a point now on board? Have you got the right technology? Have you got the right infrastructure? Have the stakeholders involved? Um, and where are the financing coming from? Did you actually predict what you thought you were going to need? And is someone creating some level of, of up-to-date schedule on that basis? Have you got the right funding coming in? And if you haven't, what are you doing about it? And I think a lot of projects are unsuccessful because those governance requirements aren't necessarily even thought about at the beginning. And if they are, they're kind of loosely put on the side because it's more exciting and sexy to get it in. Well, we're going to have to uh, wrap it up there, but uh, hopefully, hopefully the speakers will be able to stick around for part of the reception. Uh, there may be some follow-up questions, but you know, smart cities isn't a thing. It means a lot of different things. There is no cookie cutter. Use data before you decide to do smart solutions. Capture data that you generate. Secure that data and make sure that it doesn't get into the wrong hands. Um, and, and also, I think a couple of, uh, came up a couple of times, you know, ultimately, it's not going to be a smart city. Right? The connectivity that, that this engenders will create citizens that are actually connected uh, far beyond their own city. And in fact, the smart city can become a hub for the region, but also connected citizens more globally. So I think there's some uh, terrific themes here. And uh, hopefully our friends in government that are going to lead the work in here, other companies, you know, take this. And, uh, and also you can share these presentations and such with your colleagues. But uh, uh, thanks to, uh, to, to the guests here for coming and sharing. I have a deck we should have, so feel free to share that. Yeah, terrific. We'll have uh, on the, uh, the, the website for the event, we'll, we'll put up the presentations as speakers allow, as well as the video from this. But uh, please join me in, in thanking the group here.
Hallo. Hallo. Morning, Gilead Oracle. Okay, <laughs> alphabetical order. <laughs> that's easier, that's easier. <laughs> so the alphabetical order. <laughs> Hello. Can we get some Hello. more uh, water, please? And is it possible to get one coffee? Are they on now? One coffee and some water. Ron, Ron Summers. <laughs> not without the microphone. Can't hear the not without the microphone. The mic is not working. Mics. Can we get Ron to sit down? <laughs> no, I think it's on now. Excuse me, everybody. We're about to begin the uh, the next panel here. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go grab a few of the other spots there. But thank okay, you. We're, we're, we're fine. We can start. Now, this is the last panel of the day, and uh, we're sort of heading steadily towards the finance minister who will come in after this and address uh, you and take questions. But it's the first panel with a major weakness. All males. <laughs> Very sad. Rick Rosso done a great job on this conference, goofed up here. Um, you know, right through the day, we've been focusing on the four big ideas of Prime Minister Modi. Started with what the finance secretary talked about, the new empowerment of states. Jay, you were not here, but he talked about fiscal federalism and the whole you know, new direction of more resources to states, more money, more independence to take decisions and chart their own growth path. Then we got into skills, which has become a very big mission in the country, led by the PM. And then we've just finished smart cities, another big idea of his. And the fourth, which we are into now, is Make in India. And I really congratulate Rick Rosso, wherever he is, for you know, kind of building this conference around these four themes which the Prime Minister has driven amongst many other initiatives which he has done. So an amazing three words now, Make in India, crafted by him. Galvanizing in activities for investment. Investment, growth, and manufacturing. And really calling for a new industrial policy paradigm for India. And a very FDI friendly paradigm. Now thousands of words have been spoken and written on Make in India. Lots of different interpretations. And we have a panel of four here, uh, three American corporates, all with presence in India. I should uh, probably disclose that I used to be on the advisory board of Oracle, in, so I will be tough on you. OK. <laughs> um, and we have one opposition member of parliament, not from the BJP but from the state of Orissa, uh, and not part of the National Democratic Alliance led by the BJP. That is Mr. B.J. Panda. So I'm going to start with Mr. Panda. How does he see Make in India? Good, bad, indifferent? Where do you come from? Before I go to the corporates in alphabetical order. J. Panda. 
let's put this in context. India has, uh, India's workforce is approximately 450 million people. And over the next 15 years, we will be needing to create a million jobs every month to absorb this workforce, to make sure that we are gainfully employed and not go into crime or something else. If you look at our economy, it's lopsided. Uh, about 16% of our economy is in manufacturing of some kind. You compare that with China at just under 50%. Even when you compare that with our uh, peer countries, the so-called BRICS, Brazil or Malaysia, Korea, they're all way above 20%. This lopsidedness uh, hasn't happened overnight. It has taken decades of poor policies to build up, uh, decades of uh, an environment that has been hostile to business and investment. We sometimes look at the past few years where the shine wore, wore off on the India story of a dozen years ago. And we forget that this was not in isolation. India did briefly shine for a while from between the late 90s and the early mid 2000s when the effect of economic reforms from the early 90s first started kicking in. But if you look at the last 10 years, it's ironic that only last month, after a period of almost 10 years, did we manage to pass any significant economic legislation in parliament. For the past decade, there has been almost no significant economic legislation. We had a lot of social legislation. We had a lot of expenditure legislation. But we didn't have the kind of legislation that would grow the pie. Uh, what this means is that there is a lot of momentum that we have to overcome. Let me give you an example of how tough this is. The Prime Minister came in last year and started changing the narrative from the very fundamentals and going all over the world to sell the India story all over again. And by all accounts, he's been doing a great job in selling India. But if you take one measure, for instance, the World Bank has a measure called ease of doing business. Last year, India ranked 140 out of 185 countries. You'd imagine with all the effort that has gone in in the past one year, not just the announcement of the Make in India, but uh, for example, uh, FII investment has gone up 40% year on year. Uh, for example, the economic package, the three major bills that were passed that I just referred to. Guess what? In a year's time, instead of improving, we have slid a further two points. 2015, India is not 140, but 142 out of 185 countries to do business in, ease of doing business. The reason is the world isn't standing still. Everybody else is getting better. You have to run faster to just stay in the same place. And we need to make a lot of changes. Uh, if I'm sounding pessimistic, I'm not. I'm just laying out the landscape as I see it and the reasons why we are where we are today. The reality is I'm actually quite an optimist in terms of what is finally happening. Uh, one of the main problems, of course, has been the politics, and that was referred to in other panels. I was here for the just previous panel. Whether it is about cities or about manufacturing, politics often creates gridlock and uh, I know in this country you aren't unfamiliar with that. Um, the good news in India is that uh, <coughs> since the government came in last May, in the three parliament sessions that we've had, the monsoon session, the winter session, and the first half of the budget session, two of them have been the most productive in the last 10 years in terms of number of days work, number of hours work, number, number of bills passed, and as I said, fortunately now, also economic bills, not just social bills. These are all great signs that we are turning the ship around, but it is a big oil tanker. It's, it's not a little sports car.
So it is going to take a while to turn around. I'm actually quite confident that even at the rate at which we are pro progressing, we should reverse the trend in terms of the ease of business doing, uh, ease of doing business index number, even by the coming year. So our, our big shortcomings uh, are infrastructure, because we underinvested in infrastructure for many decades. Uh, regulatory hurdles, of course. And among the regulatory hurdles, I would rank uh, the single biggest hurdle of all as labor laws. We have, I think, the world's most complex, most difficult to operate in, in terms of labor laws. But there are many ways to tackle this problem. Uh, just to take a little aside, uh, I don't have the time to explain it here, but take my word for it. To get these three bills passed in Parliament took six months of trench warfare uh, in Parliament, out of sight of many observers and the media. A lot of people just thought that the government was spinning its wheels, but it wasn't. It was actually uh, reaching out across the aisle. It was building consensus. Uh, first passed ordinances, which are executive orders, temporary in nature, to signal that they were serious, and then followed up by uh, patching together the numbers in both houses of parliament to get these bills passed. These are all good signs. Labor law is a bigger hurdle than some of the laws, economic laws we have passed just recently. So the approach they seem to be taking is we don't have to do it nationally all at one go. So the party in government is sending out signals to its state units, wherever they are in government, to start taking action. And you're beginning to see in the state of Rajasthan and a few other states, early action at uh, liberalizing labor laws to be in line with uh, what uh, is needed. Uh, still doesn't go far <coughs> enough. It's, it's just a, a foot in the door kind of approach. But it is beginning to show results. I'm aware of at least one big multinational company that's in manufacturing uh, heavy equipment that has doubled down its presence in one of these states which is pioneering labor law reform. And in my interactions with them, they've told me that that is one of the crucial reasons why they're doing it. The infrastructure angle is likely to get sorted out over the next few years as some of these projects get going. Many of these projects have been held up because of uh, the government's left hand not knowing what the right hand was doing, uh, different ministries and departments uh, opposing each other. That part seems to be gradually getting sorted out because there is a decisiveness back in the government. Everybody knows where the buck stops, whereas for many years, for the past decade, uh, it was a sort of a free for all. Uh, for the past decade, the buck did not stop at the prime minister's desk. Uh, and it was uh, kind of a coalition government with, with all the horrors that you would imagine uh, that it could be. Whereas today, you have a much more decisive government. It's not a cinch. Uh, you still need to pass bills in both houses. Uh, the government does not have a majority in the upper house. But they have shown resolve, and they've shown the ability to get some bills passed in the upper house. And the good news is not everything requires legislation. Uh, there's a lot of things that are under executive action of the government that they need to take. And uh, I'm hopeful that, uh, although not everybody is pleased at the pace at which they are bringing in these changes, uh, certainly the direction is in the right direction. And I'm hopeful that uh, this will start paying off. Also, new sectors have been opened up. Uh, FDI in uh, defense, for instance, FDI in insurance, uh, I think one of the big turning points is going to be when FDI starts rising rather than financial institutional investment. Institutional investment can come in easy, go out easy, but we need the investment on the ground, we need the investment in factories, we need the investment in infrastructure projects, which is FDI. We also need to do the same thing for domestic investment. A lot of us believe that the interest rates are too high. Uh, particularly uh, since we've had a year of low inflation. Uh, the gods have been kind to us. Oil prices have been low, but for whatever reason. Uh, but we do have an independent regulator. Our central bank is the Reserve Bank of India, and uh, headed by a very credible person who's uh, introduced data-driven decision-making on the bank's policies. 
And that has not led to lowering of rates as quickly as industry would like, but there has been some lowering of rates. Uh, I'm actually hopeful that rates will continue to lower, but I'm not the person to decide that. We're just keeping our uh, fingers crossed. I'll sum up by saying this. What do I think of Make in India? Two words, vastly overdue. <laughs> uh, I'll sum up by saying this. Uh, you know, even when the India story uh, had the shine go off, we were still growing at four and a half, five percent which is not all that bad, although it's bad for a developing economy. Uh, but even when we were growing at 9%, and briefly one quarter we touched 10%, the problem was that we got caught up in hubris. All of India, our politicians, our editors, our business people, we got caught up in the hubris that it was our manifest destiny to be the next economic superpower, and we didn't have to do anything to make it happen. That was because it had been a decade or 14 years since the reforms of the early 90s when this kicked in. So the cause and effect uh, didn't stay in people's mind. This time around, things are different. I think we realize that although this vast opportunity exists for us, particularly with China sort of plateauing, not slowing down, but plateauing, we have great opportunities, but they'll be not automatic. We have to go out and make it happen. Uh, and one of the biggest things that's going to make it happen, apart from everything I've said, is what Tarun mentioned a bit earlier, is about finally, finally, after 67 years, Delhi realizing that it cannot micromanage 29 states, a full subcontinent, each and every village, and coming in with these new uh, principles of fiscal devolution which this year alone gives an additional $29 billion to the states and leaves it uh, to the states to manage their own destinies, which, as I said, I gave you an example of Rajasthan, which is one state which is taking the lead in labor law reform. Doesn't go far enough by a long shot, but is already beginning to see some results in terms of attracting investment. So I think in terms of Make in India, we have no option but to make sure our economy is balanced, not so heavily dependent on services, and agriculture, where the sons and daughters of farmers no longer want to be in farming. Uh, we have to shift the load quite a lot onto manufacturing, and not the kind of manufacturing which dominates India, which are quote unquote firms with less than 10 employees, which is all in the unregulated small sector. We need to attract uh, scale, uh, and all that I have said, I think, indicates that we are perhaps turning the ship around in the right direction. But we need to do a lot more, and we need to do it quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. I'm going to go to Rustam Desai now. He is the managing director of Corning India. Corning does not need an introduction anywhere in the world, it's certainly not in the US. It's an outstanding company. And Rustam is the chief executive of that company. Rustam, how do you see Make in India? How is, how is life? How is life in India? Is it treating you a little better, or is it all the same? Uh, what, what needs to be done? Share your thoughts with us. So, Tarun, I, I actually have a few slides, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, the short answer is that it continues to be an adventure. <laughs> continues to be an adventure. Yeah. <laughs> Can, can somebody pull my slides up? I don't know who's controlling the... Yeah. There we go. So what I, what I thought I'd share with the audience today and with the panelists is Corning's story uh, around Make in India. It's a look back at where, how we got to where we are today, and hopefully that will shed some light in terms of what's working, what isn't, uh, where the opportunities for change exist, so on and so forth. So I want to start off by trying to help people understand why we actually chose to manufacture in India. Uh, the plant that we uh, invested in makes optical fiber. Uh, optical fiber is the, the, the backbone of essentially any data voice network anywhere in the world. And there are two da data points that drove us to, to think really hard about India. One was that the, the subscriber uh, base of uh, mobile uh, 
users in India was enormous. And that compared with the, the relative scale of infrastructure that supported those subscribers was abysmal. And that created an opportunity uh, for doing business. So clearly, there was a business need for the products that we made. Uh, we also quickly realized that at least half of the market, uh, half of our end use market was actually government driven. And for those of you that participate in India, I'm sure many of you do, you know that government procurement has certain PMA requirements around it. And we thought it would be good, a good decision on our part to actually leverage that. And so we decided to invest in, in building a facility in India. Um, the, the next, once we decided, okay, we got to do India, the next question was, well, where the hell do we build this plant? It's, you know, 29 states, everyone has a different story. Some have water, others have elect you know, electricity, some have roads, others have people. You know, <laughs> what combination of those things are absolutely necessary? Can you run a plant without people or can you run it without power? Let's think about that. Um, so <laughs> we, we, we went through a very extensive process. We, we started off with a short list of 10 states, over 50 sites. We drove that down through to, to three states and five sites. And finally, um, now that it's all behind us, we can talk about it. It came down to two sites in two states. One was in Gujarat and one was in Maharashtra. And we chose Maharashtra. And fundamentally, the four, through this entire process, the four criteria that we established for ourselves in terms of how we would choose which state to go to was around the availability of infrastructure and how much it would cost us, the facilities available for employees and potential expats as we were building this facility, uh, the talent availability, and the, the, you know, full disclosure, the financial incentives that were being offered to us either by the states or at the federal level. So looking back, here's, here's how it all came out. Um, we made some assumptions about those four criteria, and then there was a set of sort of reality experiences that we had during the process uh, that in some cases was aligned with the assumptions, in other cases not. Um, we assumed infrastructure would be cheap, and we expected that we would have teething problems with, uh, with uh, the infrastructure in India. That's what everybody told us. As it turns out, neither was the um, infrastructure cheap, nor was this a question of teething problems. The infrastructure in India is really expensive, especially if you go anywhere close to a large city, um, and the infrastructure issues continue to plague us. So not a great story on that particular variable. Um, as far as facilities uh, for employees and expats is concerned, I think we made a great choice. We're right outside of Pune. Um, we had 200 plus uh, US employees, China employees visiting this plant on and off over the 18 months that it was being built. Uh, the facilities and infrastructure that Pune um, offers relative to other options that we looked at, I think made it uh, significantly improved uh, the probability that uh, our employees were safe and well taken care of and made it to and from the site. So that, that um, assumption and reality kind of proved out. Talent was the real surprise uh, for me personally. I'm, I'm Indian, I grew up in India. Um, I always, my, my assumption was that we, you, it would be easy to find lots of people. Um, it would not be easy to find lots of good people. Um, and to me, that was the biggest personal learning for me. We found a lot of people. We have also found a lot of great people. The people that work in our plant deliver a world-class product. They deliver it in many cases in a manner that is better than any of our other facilities around the world. Attrition is low. This is an awesome team. So I'd like to leave you guys with, the, with, with that one real positive from our experience. The other piece was just simple financial incentives. Some states gave more, others gave, le gave less. We chose one of the states that gave us the, the, the best package, and so we were in Maharashtra. So in hindsight, what was sort of the, the learnings from this whole experience? Um, plan for infrastructure issues sort of to endure beyond just the startup of your facility. Find ways to have your processes adjust and, and adapt to the fact that you will continue to deal with those issues. It's not a, it's not a, a, a fatal flaw in India. It's just something that you've got to plan for and be thoughtful of rather than think that it'll go away, because it won't. Um, the other piece, of course, is that those of you that haven't already done this, there's, there's always, uh, the Indian government is actually really good and thoughtful about incentives in terms of manufacturing, in terms of exporting products, so on and so forth. Be thoughtful about those things as you go into uh, deciding where to build. And then finally, um, 
people planning, people planning is critical. Build your processes and your people hiring processes and your training processes and your safety processes around building talent and retaining them because awesome, awesome talent available if, if, you, if you go about it in the right way. Okay? Uh, the next few slides is just to, some photographs to kind of bring all of this home um, for you guys. So that was the piece of land that we, <laughs> we finally landed up acquiring outside of Pune. A lovely patch of green. Uh, not much else. <laughs> you can see no electric cables. You can see no road. Certainly not a lot of people around there. Um, anyhow, it was a lovely patch of land. We took it. It took us nine months to acquire the piece of land, which I think for, the, for us it was the first time that Corning invested in a wholly owned facility in India. Including me, everybody was shocked that it took so long. But it did. It took us nine months. That's the plant. It took us 373 days from the time we moved the first piece of dirt to the time we started to sell our first piece of product from that facility. That is a worldwide record for Corning. Okay? During that process, as we mentioned earlier, we invested very heavily in training. And as I also mentioned earlier, I am really proud to report that this plant produces world-class product. We export 50% of what we make there. It makes it back to the US, it makes it to Europe, it makes it to every geography in the world. World-class product. But that's the road. <laughs> now, we ship glass. Just, just so you guys understand, our raw material <laughs> is glass. Um, and now, this is an old photograph. I'm happy to report that there is actually a road today. But this, this photograph was taken two years after the day we started selling product from the plant. We still didn't have a road connecting our facility to anything that looked like a road. And that, that is the challenge. So what, what did we have to do? We had to, we had to innovate around packaging materials, packaging processes, shipping. You know, we had to put accelerometers into our trucks to figure out you know, where, which were the biggest bumps and you know, how do we prevent uh, you know, having 100% of our raw materials show up broken. Um, but we figured it out, and uh, the plant's doing great, and we have great people, and, and it's a great story. So just watch out for you know, not having a road. And so okay, bringing all of this uh, back together, I, I always think about stuff like this and say, well, you know, what, could we have, what can we learn from all this, and how can these various components of the, the, the manufacturing equation actually help make the future of India manufacturing better? And I sat down with my team, and we did some thinking around, well, how does India stack up relative to other geographies that are potentially vying for similar manufacturing investment dollars? And the story we came out with is that as far as the market opportunity is concerned, as far as talent is concerned, and as far as sort of the investment uh, um, incentives, if you like, is concerned, India is actually, in, in many cases, far better than the competition. But there's a section in the middle around the transparency of decision making, the um, what people you know, often call the license Raj or the inspector Raj, where <coughs> essentially every bureaucrat looks at you like you've done something wrong, and then you've got to prove you, that you haven't, which is an odd place to be, but anyhow. Um, the efficiency around permitting and approval processes, um, I've, got to, I've got to tell you, um, there is a company that will not be named at this point, but that you know, participates in a, in a trade um, association with us. And they did the math around if they had sequentially um, actually um, done all their permitting one after the other rather than parallelly, they would have been, one or the other of their files would have been in an Indian government office for over 10 years. It would have taken them over 10 years to get through the approval process. So what can we all do? Um, I think if I, if I were writing the script for the India government, I'd say, Let's try and make this more about how we can attract manufacturing investment rather than allow it. The feeling you get as an investor is you're grudgingly allowed to invest, not that you're actually being invited to invest. And that subtle difference, I think, will go a long way in, in, this, in this country that has so much potential. Um, and you, know, you can read all the other bullet points at your leisure, but I think there's a role for the US government to play as well. Right? Our experience was actually the um, the US Embassy and the consular offices were tremendously helpful to us. They were tremendously helpful opening doors, having conversations that other organizations were not comfortable having with government, 
so on and so forth. So please continue that work. You know, anyone here that's in government? The embassies and the consular offices did a fantastic job for us. There's an element around how the US government can help de-risk our investment choices that I, I don't think that's going to be a secret to anybody here. Um, often other government, other companies from other jurisdictions show up with money from their companies, from their countries. And that model ought to be thought through a little bit in terms of how the US can do more around that. And then the finally, finally, the piece around what can we as corporations do to, to make all of this look, uh, you know, make the future look better. I think celebrating the wins, you know, being more vocal about the fact that yes, India yeah, does have its set of issues like many other countries do, but uh, we invested in India. It's been a very successful adventure for us. It's an adventure, but it's been a successful one. Um, and we'd probably do it again. And so it's, it's really a story of, yeah, there's a few stumbling blocks, but uh, delighted to be in India, delighted to be manufacturing there, and mostly delighted about the team that we've been able to create at our facility. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very good. Thank you very much. I uh, not ask you, but I suppose you're making money. You may suppose. <laughs> Good. Can't disclose. Um, Clifford Samuel, Vice President Gilead. You have a very different experience with India. Good to have you here. I do indeed have a different and bullish perspective on India. I think the, the theme, making India is good. I would say that we are already making in India through our various partners, which you'll see. Um, let me see if I can advance this. I'll start with a little bit of, of Gilead, and then I quickly will, will move to what we're doing. This will be brief, because I, I'm looking forward to some of the dialogue. Um, about Gilead, the mission, discover, develop, and deliver innovative medicines in areas of unmet medical need. 7,000 employees in the Bay Area, San Francisco, California, beautiful place if you ever get to visit. Um, we have a portfolio of um, pipeline and investigational medicines uh, in the area of HIV AIDS, viral hepatitis, liver disease, B and C, cancer inflammation, respiratory and cardiovascular disease, and 19 marketed products in addition to 400 ongoing or planned clinical trials. So very robust um, R&D occurring in, in highly unmet medical needs. Now, there, there's something that, 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 that we need to, to, to be clear on what you see in the next couple of slides. We have one of our board members here, Carla Hills, but with individuals like Carla, our chairman CEO, John Martin, our president CEO, um, COO John Milligan and my boss Greg Alton, we fundamentally believe that anyone who needs our medicines should have access to them, regardless of where they live or their ability to pay. Their economic means or where they live should not <coughs> impede someone to not have a cutting edge medicine that's available in the US and Europe. So how do we go about this and, and how do we tackle things like HIV where you have 35 million people living and, and in the world, 90% of them are in, in poor developing world countries and, and in other areas such as Hep C. So we approach this in a two-pronged fashion. On, on one side, we have what we call our organic infrastructure. These are our 20 distributors. They're also local individuals. Uh, Mylan is our distributor for India and South Africa. And we characterize those distributors as Gilead on the front lines. They've gone through our business conduct um, and compliance training. They do, on any given day, the regulatory submissions for the dossiers to ensure that product can be supplied sustainably. They are conducting pharmacovigilance, safety reporting, and something that we really spend a lot of time on. You can get the medicines in the country, and of course, sometimes they're not being used because they don't have enough doctors. We spend a lot of time on public health, medical education and training, and also health system strengthening. So that's what our distributors are doing on any given day. Now, recognizing the magnitude of this pandemic, 
and I'm responsible for 130 countries. The 130 countries span from Mexico, Central America, Caribbean, all of Africa, South, Southeast Asia, Pacific. So what we do, we recognize that this is not possible on our own. So we have engaged India's finest. India's finest are their manufacturers of, of, of medicines. India, in my country, I'm from the West Indies, India has always been the pharmaceutical engine for the poor. And what we've done starting in 2006, because I must tell you in 2003 we failed miserably. Um, a bit of hubris, as someone might have said here, uh, can get the best of you, but we did learn that you can't do it alone and just making a price lower and saying everybody can come and get it doesn't mean anyone will come and get it. And that's what happened in 2003. In 2006, we decided that we should engage our generic manufacturers out of India. They're the best at it. It started with um, 94 countries. And, and I can say then we had 30,000 patients on treatment. Fast forward, we also, um, um, joined the medicines patent pool, which is very similar to what we're doing with our Indian manufacturers, but independent of a, of a pharmaceutical company. In 2014, we have 19 generic manufacturers now, so it went from 11 to 19. It's a constantly evolving program. And now, our Indian partners of the 7.3 million patients that are on our medicines in these 130 countries, Six million of them are being supplied by our Indian generic partners. And that's phenomenal. That's across Africa, Asia Pacific, Latin America. This is India making it. So making India is good, but uh, there are sectors that are already making it. And these factories have hundreds of people. You go to Cipla in Goa or Bayakan, Zydus, they have hundreds of people, different shifts 24 7. So very viable industry. Um, India, we just um, launched our drug for hepatitis C, which in combination with two other medicines is a cure, a cure for hepatitis C. India is the first country in the Asian region in four months approved Sovaldi for hepatitis C. And following the similar but different format of the generics arrangements for HIV, we have now 11 partners gearing up. Some of them have already launched their version of um, Sovaldi in India. So um, you couldn't ask for a better story on, on what is being done and, and, and what can be done in the future. Um, when we look at global reach, you could see that um, on the HIV side, it's 112 countries. Um, on the hepatitis C side, it's 91 countries. The HIV side represents about 30 million of the 35 million. That's what Indian manufacturers are, are, are providing medicines for. On the hepatitis C side, it will be up to 100 million people that could be reached. We've calculated that um, $2 billion have been made since 2007 via our generic partners. Now, one thing to mention, what we do is um, we take our medicines, for example, this Havoni, which was just approved for the cure of hep C, and we take that and do a technology transfer to our Indian manufacturers. <coughs> now, this is in spite of not having our patent issued in India, because as I mentioned from our board and our chairman CEO, we fundamentally believe that IP issues, intellectual property issues, are separate from saving lives. Now, I must say that it would be ideal if we had a patent issued because it would cement this model of doing a technology transfer of our know-how to generic Indian generic partners. They are free to set their own price to make any combination of medicines they elect to make. Uh, they are free to sell the active pharmaceutical ingredient to each other. This is all their business. It's a hands-off relationship. What we do help with is if they run into any issues making the product as quickly as possible, we're there to assist because we really do want the medicines to get to the poorest of the poor. But clearly, Indian manufacturers are the best at high volume, um, um, large scale up uh, manufacturing, and it's proven. It's proven in our model. So um, you couldn't ask for a better slide if you're looking at geographically dispersed regions. 
Uh, you have manufacturers in every part of um, <coughs> the major cities. And, and I say there are opportunities here to broaden this as we go along. And um, numbers always speak for themselves. The proofs are in, in the numbers. Uh, Nine-year relationship, 19 partners on the HIV side, eight Gilead products. We're also looking at oncology. I mentioned inflammation, oncology, respiratory. Um, these medicines will, will transcend into this model as well. Um, one of the key aspects of quality is um, gaining approval, tentative FDA approval by the US FDA and WHO pre-qualification. We have 39 of them. I mentioned the 6 million and the opportunity for 100 million um, on the HCP side, but clearly, we have seen an 80% reduction in price. This is exactly what we wanted to see. Price going down, volumes going up, lives being saved. I think uh, this is phenomenal, which is why I'm, I'm bullish. Um, I'll close with this slide. Last September, our drug Sovaldi, which was approved in um, 2013, I think December. Um, brand new product, FDA approved. You have 20 years of patent exclusivity. We launched the Make in India licensing agreements with 11 of our partners um, in, in India. They're moving, they're getting it done. I, I, I will close in saying that uh, um, this is wonderful. India is in a good spot. Um, two things I think needs to occur. Um, um, the recognition of intellectual property because it can flow both ways. Our partners are improving what we have even made. Uh, they're coming up with novel ways of improvements. Uh, you want to patent those. You want to make those available in China and Brazil and other places. The respect for IP would cement what we're trying to accomplish here. It's a model that says on either side of the aisle, multinationals say you can't do business in India. Uh, uh, India is saying you know, your products aren't getting to the poor. This starts the dialogue and, and actually show by doing. So the respect for IP or the issuance of intellectual property and, and, and investment in healthcare of its citizens. It doesn't matter what you try to do or what you try to make. You're going to have to have healthy citizens to execute, to get that road done or to do anything. You do need investments in, um, in, in the healthcare systems. So thank you very much. I hope I didn't go too far. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was terrific. Thank you. A very, very different, very unique model of operating around the world and in India. Joe, take it away. Thank you. I'll, I'll sit technology here. Technology company. I'll sit here because I don't actually have slides. So um, we certainly welcome Make in India, and we think uh, we shouldn't forget what I consider to be its companion, which is Digital India, because both of them together make an exceedingly compelling argument. And it's also useful because both of them together create a strategic vision across sectors. And that's tremendously important because that creates that cohesion across the government that is necessary when you start looking at these solutions because many of the issues the government has to deal with, especially if you deal with perceptions from the outside, are macro issues. And this kind of strategic whole of the government vision becomes very important to selling the desirability of the destination for investment. So one, we strongly welcome the combination of Make in India and Digital India. We also think it's important because it started to shift the vision of ICT as merely an, a destination to attract investment to also consider ICT, information communication technologies, as an enabler across all sectors. And that is, in fact, the real role of ICT, is enablement across sectors, not just a sector in which you want to have investment in production. Um, as articulated and as, as, as set forth so far, uh, the Make in India uh, program is an incentive-driven, as you pointed out, FDI-friendly, and I would call it a race to the top. I mean, the, the information communication technology business processing outsourcing industry in India is the example of what happens when you have a, an incentive-driven race to the top. It went from an industry that had small scale to an industry that became large scale to an industry that had export to an industry that's a world-class leader. And that is the potential you have, but you grow stepwise as you need to 
and the incentives are logical in the relation of the context of where the industry is. We had previously seen some experience with the fallacy of what a top-down imposed set of manufacturing requirements would look like. And the history of that, wherever it is done, is that what you end up having is a manufacturing industry that will only ever manufacture something that is good enough for the domestic market, something that will not create an, an export market, and something that will lead to the mediocrity of the product as opposed to the world-class product. So we are very happy to see that that is not the path that was chosen uh, in this exercise, and we strongly, strongly commend that that not be something that falls back. That path would not be a path to a productive and bright future. Uh, a number of people have, have pointed out there's an infrastructure reality, uh, and, and that is the truth. Um, I sometimes call it the money on the table issue. There's a huge unmet market demand in India. There's a growing set of incentives. And in my experience, the Indian businessmen I have met are among the most entrepreneurial in the world. And if you tell me there is a table full of money and a whole met bunch of unmet demand, and those tremendously entrepreneurial people have no desire to pick up that money, then you have some infrastructure problems that you need to address first. There are some basic issues that are preventing someone from picking up money from that pile. And some of it may be the questions of, do you have the electricity, the people, the facilities, everything in the right place? Um, so, you know, especially when you're talking about the highest tech manufacturing, the fault tolerance is very slim, uh, the need to have very constant supplies of electricity, good supplies of water, skills, legal certainty, as was highlighted previously, and then an understanding of your competitive global dynamic. When the BPO industry started in India, India was kind of the game in town. If you look globally, there wasn't a whole lot of a competitive environment there. Today, both in manufacturing and in services, there's a huge competitive environment of lots of peer countries trying to create incentives to drive people to come to them. Choose me, choose me. Let me show you the package I'm gonna give you. Let me show you how nice my welcome mat is. Not allow, attract, as the statement was made. I'm going to steal that from you on occasion, if you don't mind. <laughs> um, so um, we also have to think when, I, I understand, the million people that have to join the job market on a monthly basis and the desire for manufacturing. But let's also not forget that everything has a multiplier effect that also leads to manufacturing. The multiplier effect in services is thought to be about four to one. Four jobs are created for every job in the services sector. Well, those jobs include construction. Those jobs include people who make consumer electronic. Those jobs include a lot of things where people are producing to go into that value chain. So let us not misunderstand that those tales of production are also very important. So even if you're involved in services, services creates a manufacturing tale of its own. And that has to be considered as part of Make in India as well. The next thing I wanted to highlight was kind of going to the macro issue and a couple of the speakers before me have gotten to elements of them, but there was a very organized way of looking at those elements that came out of a, a document that was created in APEC the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation, which is essentially all the Pacific Rim countries. And it was signed by leaders, so this is a, a document endorsed at the highest level APEC has to endorse at. And it was called the Digital Prosperity Checklist. And the Digital Prosperity Checklist said, what is it that an economy has to do today to attract someone to say, I wanna put my next facility or I wanna put my investment dollars in that? And the answer is it's not one element. It's multiple elements, and they operate in a matrix, which means they're codependent to each other. And the elements were infrastructure. What is your physical infrastructure? What is your regulatory infrastructure? For example, the labor laws. What are your infrastructure opportunities? Investment. Do you have fluid capital markets? Do you, en you enable foreign direct investment? Do you have microfinancing, if that's the nature of the investment that's appropriate for your market? Intellectual capital, what is the preparedness of your population in terms of entrepreneurial skills, linguistic skills, technological skills? Information flows, if information is the currency or the oil of the digital economy, how can you use and manage information across your economy? Uh, innovation, how does your economy support 
uh, innovation, and finally integration, and that's the one where we cheated uh, because the, we were coming up, we thought, we thought alliteration was very good and we wanted six eyes, and we couldn't come up with a reasonable eye for trade. So we called it integration, but that really means trade behind the border, at the border, and across the border. And it is that economic and policy orientation towards all six of these eyes and the way they work in integration that actually makes the economy attractive for investment. So while you may have companies that can bring, either that can leverage existing world-class manufacturer as was done by Gilead or who bring their technology in as was done by Corning, you have lots of folks who are looking for where are the component manufacturers I can have? And the question is, how do we make those become best of breed in India? Because you cannot incorporate into a globally uh, acclimated supply chain a less than a globally qualified manufacturer. So we have a chicken and egg problem with Make in India, which is we have to also raise the level and the competence of some of those people who manufacture a piece of the solution and want to become part of your supply chain. And I think part of that is education, part of that is the fact that the Indian economy is developing those on its own, part of that is finding the strengths. So India's strength in the drug manufacture was they had mastered many of the productions for making quality drugs at a lower price. Sometimes it's because they, ha they have, they have uh, mastered the concept of I can come up with a more simplified solution to a problem that may be able to address a mass market requirement. And the problem is, right away when you see Make in India and you see tech companies involved, someone wants to know where's the, ne the next chip fab. Beca and chip fabrication is a very delicate, high strung, requiring lots of tolerances. Let's figure out how we walk before we run. Maybe the component manufacturers are the place to start. Maybe that's part of the concept. Maybe understanding where India's skills are best suited. It's not that chip fabrication shouldn't be part of the strategy along the path, but it's maybe not the first step you go to. So we actually think Make in India and Digital India combined are a powerful incentive. We think the smart cities will be consumers of some of what gets manufactured in this. So we think this whole of government approach related to the strategic direction uh, is a very positive uh, development in India, uh, puts truth to the concept of why there is so much optimism um, the one caution I would perhaps have is the work ethic um, at the very top of Indian leadership is a difficult one for anyone else in the government to match. Um, the concepts we've heard of you know, getting, getting the 9 or 10 or 11 p.m. phone call about the presentation you're going to make to me the next day are somewhat legendary. And the concern is there is such a desire to please and meet the schedule that there is a concern of overpromising in some cases. And the overpromising leads to a failure that doesn't exist. Because if you don't meet an objective that was never a realistic objective, then it shouldn't be considered a failure. And from a public <coughs> perception and an external perception, it is not useful for India to have such an expectation that it cannot meet. So the only thing I would say is to temper some of the realistic objectives and realistic time frames, because I think there has been an overambition which doesn't necessarily help India, which has every opportunity to make the milestones it needs to make, but the milestones have to be realistic to achieve. Thank you. Thank you very much. You've had one uh, great overview and three terrific presentations by the three U.S. corporates. We have 10 minutes for questions. Uh, name, uh, brevity, and question, not speech. D Desi, <laughs> Desi Schaefer. Schaefer from the Marty Associates in Brookings. Um, Mike, coming to you. Tazy Schaefer from McLarty Associates in Brookings. Wonderful presentations. Uh, I had occasion to call on a, a joint secretary in one of the ministries in India who handed me his business card with Make in India actually on the top side and his name on the bottom, uh, and gave me a stirring presentation of how the Make in India initiative was all about infrastructure, which he defined 
both in the way Mr. Desai and Jay de defined it, but also to include things like training. My question is, for those of you who have uh, run enterprises in India that actually make something, um, are you seeing uh, government initiatives either in physical infrastructure or in people infrastructure? And if you could write your own ticket, what kind of government initiatives would you look at or would you look at incentives for companies to do more of that themselves? Any of you want to take this? Uh, yeah. System? I'd be happy to. Hey, you know, it really comes down to, I can only speak for Corning, but we're not good at making roads, right? It's, it's, not, it's just not core to what we do. And so um, an environment that has the physical infrastructure in some state that looks like ready before that infrastructure gets offered to corporations to show up, I think we'll, we'll have a, a, there'll be a line of companies waiting to invest in properties like that. It will be a no-brainer for US corporations because all the other elements are already in place. There's a market, there's talent, there's, there's all the other things that are required, you know, the six I's to make uh, this, uh, this jurisdiction be exciting from, a, um, from an investment standpoint are already there. You fix the one problem, and I would offer that that will create a gravy train of potential investors. Just make sure there's electricity, water, and roads. Really, it's, it's that simple. If the government can take care of that piece, um, I think the, the investment dollars w will not stop. It turns out uh, that the government isn't very good either at making roads and <laughs> building electricity. <laughs> but, but I'll tell you where. Uh, let, me, let me tell you what the answer is. The answer is not for government to do everything, but government to be responsible for it and facilitate it. There are other companies that are very good at building roads, and there are other companies that are very good at building electricity plants. Uh, the last time around that this happened, it all got sucked into crony capitalism and scandals. So all the SEZs that were put up were scandal-ridden. Uh, these are places that you would have happily walked into and all these problems been taken care of you. Uh, were they not so scandal-ridden? This time around, uh, I'm a bit more hopeful because in changing the narrative, the government has been actually talking about being pro-business, pro-markets, but no, not pro uh, specific cronies who get to get all the deals. And I think if that is implemented properly, uh, it should be a win-win situation because leaving it to the government is going to be worse than leaving it to you, than build, <laughs> building the roads. Tessie, I think there is a lot of pressure now uh, to make up the backlog on infrastructure projects, but it will take time. Infrastructure by its nature is not something built overnight. Um, most of our highways now, the new highways and all have been built by foreign companies, roughly 30% by Malaysian companies, and the quality is world class, you can see that. But uh, that needs to extend beyond the highways, essentially. I think, um, as well, I mentioned it already, that uh, the IP laws should be looked at. I think there's uh, a lot of companies that would love to take advantage of the, the scientific minds and, and know-how in India, um, but they are worried. Um, it's not our stance. We have life-saving medicines. We're going to continue. But um, perhaps the model will, will help bring some of that dialogue to the table. Yes, Adam. <coughs> Mike there, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Sadan Dhumi from the American Enterprise Institute. And I have a very quick clarification and, uh, and a question. Uh, the clarification is that in terms of ease of doing business, even though that 2015 number India declined from 140 to 142, the period measured is the summer of 2013 to 2014. So what we're going to see in terms of whether this government has delivered or not will come out in the 2016 number. My question is also for uh, Mr. Panda. Um, you, know, you have this sort of advantage of looking at India, not only from Delhi, but also being an MP who's very involved with your state and your constituency. So when you look at Make in India putting on your state hat, where do you see opportunities for the state government or for RISA to make reforms or to move to attract investment in a way that it could not have, say, before the election of this government at the center? Well, if you look at Odisha, uh, it may not be typical for uh, all of India, although there are some common threads. But Odisha is a good example because it has turned around from being a basket case for many decades 
to being one of the uh, fastest growing economies inside of India for the past decade. The common thread, the problem that we all face is land acquisition. And this is a challenge that we are now dealing with. There is an ordinance out on it, but we have not been able to thrash through legislation. I expect the legislation will take close to a year to happen uh, because of various technical requirements for land acquisition. Now, I mentioned land acquisition because Odisha being mineral rich has had these gigantic process industry plants that have got stuck because of land acquisition. The Korean Pohang Steel Company, the Vedanta uh, aluminum plant. Uh, the good news is that there's lots of other stuff that's happening. There's infrastructure that's happening. The tourism sector is booming. This is one of the things that the Prime Minister has actually personally led in terms of making visa-free arrival to India or visa on arrival in India to 40 countries now going up to 150 countries. Just to remove that hurdle of hassle of visiting India uh, is, is making a big difference. Uh, so we are beginning to see lots of increase in uh, flights. Uh, fortunately, our new airport came in a few years ago, so we are lucky. <coughs> but we, we need dozens of more airports all around the country. And these seem to be easier hurdles to overcome than some of the other big infrastructure projects. I mean airports. Uh, ports. Uh, in Odessa, we have a 500-kilometer coastline. We used to have one port. We today have three operational ports. Uh, so these are some of the opportunities. Um, there's lots of uh, uh, private uh, educational institutions that are coming up. Uh, in the past, these used to be not up to the mark. Uh, recent examples are getting to be better. Uh, so I think, and, and IT, for instance, nobody thinks of Odessa as an IT center, seventh largest employer of uh, information technology professionals in the country. So there's lots happening under the radar. When people think of IT, they think of Bangalore or Hyderabad or Pune. Uh, they don't think of the tier, C, uh, the tier 3 cities that are beginning to employ thousands of IT professionals all across the country. So that's what I see as the glass half full. Ray. Uh, Mr. Samuel, I have a question. Um, I'm Ray Vickery uh, from Albright Stonebridge. Um, uh, evidently, one of the factors uh, in Gilead's success in India, where others have failed, has been your uh, two-tier pricing uh, system, which allows uh, for a lower price in India than in other markets. And I'm, uh, it seems to me that that might have some implications for other companies which are heavily intellectually, intellectual property based. And I'm wondering if you might elaborate a little bit more on how that uh, pricing structure works. Sure. Um, it's, it's evolved over the years. Um, initially, we took the, the 130 countries on, for HIV and, and actually looked at World Bank classifications and GNI per capita and then disease prevalence. So GNI per capita, disease prevalence, and you came up with two categories, low income or low middle income. And then we set a, a price based on, on those two tiers. Um, so that was in 2006. Now we've evolved because you'll, you'll find even, even with a low income or, or low middle income country, you still have that economic pyramid of the have, have less and have not. So, so you, we, we're, we're looking at diff, three different types of models now. One is a differential pricing um, based on those, those uh, criteria where you set a, a private market price, a low income price to the, to the Ministry of Health where you can actually negotiate volumes agreements. Um, and, and then maybe in some countries you have a, a military or some other entity that uh, that, that has its own budget and, and purchasing. In many ways, I've spent years in the US, it's no different from, from the VA, Aetna Cigna, and uh, Medicaid Medicare. Um, so it's, 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 it's really just utilizing what's been around and, and having a conversation with the ministry to see what they're ready to participate in. Last question. Um, young man at the back, hmm. his hand went up first. Thank you, Tarun. Um, my name is Sanjeev Joshipura. I run SJ Consulting, which is a U.S.-India focused public policy and business consulting firm. My question is for Mr. Panda. 
in your opening remarks, Mr. Panda, you mentioned executive orders. And without getting into the arcane details of parliamentary procedure or anything like that, uh, I want to ask you a question around those executive orders as it pertains to certainty, policy certainty for investors. In the United States as well, we've had a problem with executive orders and you know a controversy around that with what Mr. Obama has done on immigration and so forth. Uh, and in India, uh, I'm wondering whether there are any sunset clauses applicable to executive orders that parliament can rescind unless a formal bill is passed on those specific issues. Thank you. Uh. <coughs> Parliament can do anything. Uh, parliament can make retrospective laws, which I think are a very bad idea. Uh, but I don't think it's highly likely that Parliament will actually consider retrospective laws, with perhaps one exception. The contentious issue is the land acquisition issue. Now, I've written extensively on both ordinances and on land acquisition. You might want to just look up my articles. I've addressed some of this. So because I have to be brief here, I'd like to say that, in fact, uh, investors or corporates who would take advantage of those ordinances to make investments are being cautious. But uh, I don't think they will continue to be cautious across the board. They will probably be cautious on lands being acquired by ordinance. And in any case, most of the lands being acquired for ordinance are for purely, truly public purpose, rather than for uh, industrial estates or anything like that. Uh, technically, let's be very clear, parliament, parliament does have the authority to make retrospective laws. But in all likelihood, I would, you know, I'd be pretty willing to bet that uh, if you go ahead and, and make investment decisions based on ordinances which have been passed, uh, you're okay. Some quick takeaways before we conclude because Rick Rosso wants us to finish by 3.45. Um, just taking Rustam's first comment, he said India is an adventure. I think the challenge for us is to not make it an adventure. <laughs> just to respond to that. I think that was a very important point uh, that you made. Uh, you made it lightheartedly, but I think there's a very major message there. Second, very positive point, and I think that's coming out everywhere, people. Quality of people, talent, uh, low attrition. This is, this is a great place to find good people. I think this, this is the experience of many companies, including, I think, the companies on the panel. Third, I think right across, infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. I think this has come through from everyone. Uh, different kinds of infrastructure, not just physical infrastructure, but different kinds of infrastructure. And that is going to make a huge difference to make in India, investments, growth, and all of that. So uh, there is, as I said, a lot of attention to it, but we've got to get it done now. It has to go beyond talking about it. Um, attract, not allow. I think this is a huge issue, huge issue, because I think many, many corporates, including all Indian corporates actually, face this problem of uh, the bureaucracy taking a attitude of allow. We're doing you a favor by meeting you, you know. Uh, they are allowing you to set up industry. So for me, it seems that Prime Minister has to go through a blood transfusion. <laughs> He has to bring in people uh, with domain knowledge, with self-confidence, uh, with integrity and competence who will get the job done for him. He's done a little bit of that uh, blood transfusion. Uh, it's uh, making a difference in some areas, but he hasn't done it yet in, in some of the domestic uh, areas. It's, it's actually made a huge difference in the international relations area by, by making uh, significant changes there. So, a uh, very important point uh, from you, Rostam. Uh, one hears it too much everywhere, and everybody is, uh, feels this pain of uh, dealing with the uh, administration. Um, I think these are some of the quick takeaways. 
I think it's been a great session. Prime Minister obviously has a great vision. Uh, I think we need to get the architecture right and the implementation right. These two are still work in progress. Uh, before we conclude, and I thank this panel, I just want to recognize one great man who's been sitting through our session quietly, Professor Jagdish Bhagwati. There, Jagdish, will you raise your hand? Uh, one of our leading global thinkers. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here and Thank for you. speaking. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.